I'm a professor of psychiatry at Tufts University School of Medicine, and I was for many years director of the Sleep Disorder Center here at Newton Wellesley Hospital, all in the Boston area. Oh, I'm very honored that you're calling me a pioneer of uh, sleep research. I think pioneer is a, is a good word. I think of myself as a pioneer, an explorer. I've always asked big questions. Uh, last year they called me a founder of the Sleep Research Society. That's not a good term. I didn't, I didn't found anything. But I definitely explored and pioneered. And when I was asked to do this, I just realized that uh, it's been 50 years. I did my first sleep-related project in 1961, and um, I'm still at it. I've just, just published two books uh, in the past two months, one, The Nature and Functions of Dreaming, and one is called Boundaries, A New Way to Look at the World. But, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. So I started uh, my interest in sleep and, and in dreaming. I, I, I loved dreaming even before uh, I knew much about sleep. I started in the 1960s. Uh, <clears throat> in the early 60s, I was intrigued, of course, by the work of Hazrinsk and Kleitman, the fact that we now had what seemed like a biology of dreaming. And I did a number of studies relating to the basic uh, REM non-REM cycle, which we sometimes call the basic sleep-dream cycle or the basic rest-activity cycle. <coughs> One of my early studies that people still ask me about was uh, sleep and dream patterns in the elephant, which we did at the zoo here. We didn't uh, plan like those. We did very careful observations of the elephants, minute by minute, for 96 hours. And we established a basic REM non-REM cycle of about 140 minutes in the elephant. <coughs> it seems like just a detail, but it fit very nicely into the, our, our scheme that the length of the uh, cycle is uh, inversely related to the metabolic rate of the species. And so we had data the mice, uh, the mouse, the rat, the cat, humans, and elephants at that time. And we do a beautiful curve. And this, uh, this also established very clearly that this REM non-REM cycle was a basic cycle of the mammalian body. It was not just something that happened in humans, it happened to be called dreams. So I and my laboratory did a, a great deal of work on the basic, basic aspects of REM and non-REM sleep, or the neurochemistry of sleep. We have many, many studies on the neurochemical changes in sleep, REM sleep. We have pharmacological changes. <coughs> well, we wanted to establish both the basic uh, chemistry, basic biology of I'm not going to sleep, you know, everyone was doing that. And also we were looking for clinical applications. Uh, and we were looking for uh, entrees, for ways of getting at the f possible functions of sleep. So we did, for, among other things, we, we did the first, and that's, I think still the most complete set of long-term pharmacological studies, the effects of pharmacological agents on sleep. We took very specific agents that had known mechanisms of action, for instance, uh, chlorpromazine, the serpine, one of the antidepressants, one of the tranquilizers, chloral hydrate, and placebo. And we studied all six of these substances, including placebo, for a whole month on medication, and then a whole month off medication. So we established some beautiful curves about the effects of drugs on sleep. <clears throat> um, in the more basic animal studies, uh, we showed that many different substances would reduce REM sleep. That was very nonspecific. But about the only way to increase REM sleep <clears throat> at that time was to lower 
norepinephrine levels. So lower norepinephrine increased them sleep. Um, you can also do it with acetylcholine, which we didn't study as much at that time. But it led to our, our whole uh, thesis on the functions of sleep, that the, the norepinephrine systems are somehow uh, being repaired, being restored during REM sleep. But the norepinephrine systems are, are offline, are kind of going crazy for a while in REM sleep, a lot of variability, but that they are eventually being restored. And this, uh, this still works. The, uh, the, there are many, many different norepinephrine catecholamine dependent systems. The, the one that has the largest, the grossest effect is thermal regulation. And of course, all the studies by Rechtschaff and his group suggested that uh, that was very important in uh, functions of REM sleep. An animal without REM sleep actually died of the lack of proper thermal regulation. So our view of the functions of sleep includes that. It's uh, an norepinephrine which is being restored, perhaps something as simple as upregulation, being upregulated, being restored in REM sleep. This is necessary for proper functioning of thermal regulation and a whole series of other norepinephrine dependent uh, systems. And even at the cortical level, we can relate that to the functions of dreaming. Dreaming, in a, in a simple-minded way, is the cortical, the, the, you know, what's happening in dreaming is the cortic, cortical activation of a certain kind of person that I'm asleep. And that also, we believe, has a regulatory system, has a regulatory function. Well, okay, there's an approach to uh, my, my book, the Functions of Sleep in 1973, reviewed all the data, including the norepinephrine data, a great deal of deprivation data, and studies of long and short sleepers, which all led to these views of the functions of sleep. Uh, so this, our, stu our initial studies of long and short sleepers, which uh, still referred to a lot, was part of the study of the functions of sleep. You know, we, one Deprivation is one aspect, one way to study function. Another way would be, can we find people who don't sleep? You know, and what are they like? That would show us something about functions. But there are no people who don't sleep. But, in the, uh, but we got close to it by finding a bunch of people who never slept more than six hours and did not appear to need more than six hours. And we compared them with normal sleepers, other people who slept more than nine hours. And we found some very interesting results on uh, long and short sleepers. Uh, in terms of REM and non-REM sleep, the difference was in REM sleep. Long, short, and normal sleepers all had about the same amount of a deep, slow wave sleep, stage four. They differed in, in REM sleep. And they differed in uh, personality and a number of interesting things that we related to REM sleep. <coughs> um, all right, so we studied the functions of REM sleep. Our studies of the biogenic amines in sleep also led to some clinical implications. Uh, we found that raising serotonin levels uh, increase sleep and the reduced sleep latency. And we could do this, the simplest, uh, cleanest way to do this was by simply administering L-tryptophan. And we showed very clearly in animals and in humans many human studies that L-tryptophan uh, reduces sleep latency in, in anyone with a uh, long sleep latency, whether it's called a, whether the person is considered an insomniac or not. That's quite well established. In the fact, uh, tryptophan is on the market as a sleep-inducing substance in many countries. In the United States, it's hard to get L-tryptophan because it, there was a contaminated supply that led to some cases of severe eosinophilic myalgia. The FDA removed it from the market, and it's, it's, it's available but with difficulty at the moment. So that, so that was a whole series. We must have done 30 or 40 studies on the effects of tryptophan, which are pretty well established. <coughs> 
uh, studies on the means also led to a whole theory of schizophrenia. As I said, I, I always look at the big questions, and we actually pushed things somewhat. We considered the possibility that a life, even though schizophrenia is a marvelously complicated condition or a series of conditions, we, we tried to determine how much of it could be produced by something as simple as the action of norepinephrine, uh, the action of dopamine in at norepinephrine sites, at places where you'd expect norepinephrine to be acting, if or a lot of dopamine instead, you get something that might be related to schizophrenia. And we did some studies with dopamine beta hydroxylase, the inhibitor of the dopamine to norepinephrine step. And we did show some interesting symptoms, but obviously this is a very tiny part of schizophrenia. Uh, that has not held up as a major, as major schizophrenia uh, discoveries. <coughs> uh, among the other things we found with, in our studies of the amines uh, were the fact that dopamine, uh, which brain dopamine can be raised in humans by administering L-dopa, that L-dopa does not clearly change remnant of sleep but it increases the activity, in a sense, of REM sleep. And, it, and we measure this by looking at the dreams after L-dopa and after placebo, and there was a very significant effect. Dreams after small doses of L-dopa administered uh, at night would, uh, compared to L-dopa administered the same, same way. Uh, the dreams after L-dopa were scored on a blind basis as more dream-like, more nightmare-like, more vivid, and so on. So dopamine has something to do with uh, nightmares. And in fact, of course, nightmares are sometimes an early sign, or an early symptom of schizophrenia. We, we looked at that a great deal. And then we got, uh, I hope that was where I got very interested in nightmares. Uh, we asked the question, who has nightmares? There's one kind that occurs uh, after trauma. We studied that too, PTSD. But we were interested in people who seem to have a lot of nightmares lifelong without having experienced clear-cut trauma. And we did a great many studies on characteristics of nightmare sufferers. And um, we found many things, but the way we put it together was that the nightmare sufferers who did not have trauma had thin boundaries, many, many psychological senses. I, I don't have time to describe them all, but the, you know, some people have thick boundaries, everything is kept separate, thoughts are here, feelings are there, I'm here, you're there, men are here, women are there, as opposed to thin boundaries, which is more merging, fusing, in between states. We have a boundary questionnaire that's been taken by 20,000 people by now. So people who have scored thin on the boundary questionnaire uh, turn out to have more nightmares. And, and, it, and once we got the studies going on the boundary questionnaire, what was even more striking was the relationship to simply to dream. People with thin boundaries recalled more dreams and had more vivid and interesting dreams. So we have many studies along those lines. And we've, and as I mentioned, I've had a whole book about boundaries that's just come out. Uh, boundaries, a new way to look at the world. The old data is all in the book Boundaries in the Mind. And that's being, so boundaries is being studied by psychologists uh, in great detail now. Um, <coughs> Now, the, in addition to the boundary questionnaire, we got, I've always been interested in dreams, but more recently we've studied dreams in a number of very basic ways. Now, the fact that I worked on for so many years that most dreams occur in REM sleep does not tell us much about what a dream is, what's really going on. So we, start, we started over again, in a sense, looking at actual dream content, and we looked at the a very common situation 
for fun to be very common. Someone who's just experienced a trauma, an adult who's had a single trauma, like escape from a burning house, often has a dream of I'm on the seashore and a huge tidal wave sweeps me away. So that's the paradigm that we started with. Uh, in the simplest case, the dream simply pictures the emotion. Of this person has been nowhere near the ocean lately. But the, the dream, I'm swept away by a tidal wave, obviously pictures his emotion. He is overwhelmed. You know, I'm overwhelmed. I'm terror. You know, I'm experiencing fear and terror. I feel overwhelmed. I feel swept away. You know, that's pictured as a tidal wave. And then we've gone on, so we call that the central image of the dream. We have many, many statistical studies about when dreams have powerful central images, not always tidal waves, of course. But that has led us to a whole view of uh, dreaming, uh, which very quickly I could summarize. It starts with a tidal wave dream, pictures the emotion. Uh, just, just very quickly, the whole view is that dreaming is one end of a continuum of mental functioning, uh, which also means dreaming is one end of a continuum of cerebral cortical functioning. Yeah. And the continuum goes more or less from focused waking at one end, looser waking, focused waking thought, looser waking thought, daydreaming, fantasy, reveling, and then dreaming. Dreaming, even though it often, maybe usually occurs in time sleep, is not that different. We have many studies showing that dreams cannot be distinguished from daydreams, fantasies, revelries. There's a great deal of overlap. So it's better to think of it as one end of a continuum than to say it's totally different because it occurs during sleep. So dreaming is one end of the continuum. At that end, of course, there's hyperconnection. Things are connected more broadly in many, many different senses. And we're, we're getting to the, the biological senses too. But in many senses, the dreaming end is hyperconnective. But the connections are not made randomly. They are driven or guided by the emotion of the dreamer. When there's more powerful emotion, you get more powerful central images. We've shown, for instance, in a recent study published in Sleep, of uh, 900 dreams, a systematic study of the same people before and after 9-11-01, what, what was different, only, only that, only the intensity of the central image, that, on a blind basis, that could differentiate dreams after 9-11 from dreams before 9-11. Nothing else. The dreams were not longer, they were not more vivid or more dreamlike, uh, or anything else that we could measure, but they had more powerful central images. And the images tended towards you know, the score, and not only scored the intensity of the image, but scored what emotion might be involved. And the emotions, as expected, were more towards fear, terror, anxiety. But the power of the central image was very important. All right, I think I should stop there. I've talked um, close to 20 minutes. Uh, as I said, I've, I've been interested in big questions, functions of dreaming, <laughs> possible aspects of schizophrenia, basic cycles, basic nature and functions of dreaming. But I've tried to gather a lot of data. I'm, you know, we, sleep, sleep is now considered very much a scientific data-driven field. You know, people love to use the word data-driven. Well, I have to say, I love data, but I'm not data-driven. I'm driven by the ideas. The ideas lead to the studies. And then, of course, you have to collect a great deal of data and see whether it works. Okay, thank you very much for listening to it. A 20 minute view of 50 years of sleep related research. Thank you.